Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cargill Bahal. Cargill, for the mountainous border town separating India from Pakistan, where my grandfather proudly defended his nation. And Bahal, for the small village on the Indian subcontinent where my family's journey began hundreds of years ago. Starting with my name, I always differed from my American friends. While most of them read the Bible, I prayed to an entirely different set of goddesses. While they listened to the radio on the way to school in the morning, my dad would be singing along to Bollywood songs from the 80s. And while lots of them could see their grandparents on the weekends, I have to cross an ocean to hug mine. Growing up in America unintentionally created a distance from my Indian heritage so that I didn't really know everything about my country or my culture. That all changed in 2014, right here in Atlanta at Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, where my family awaited to board a flight to visit India. My mind was excitedly racing through images of what I knew about the country. The Taj Mahal, the Bengal Tigers, and mangoes. Lots and lots of mangoes. I saw my mom shoot a nervous glance at my dad. What's going on, I thought to myself. My mom confided, kids, we haven't been completely honest with y'all. Your dad has actually been offered a job, and we may be moving to India this summer. We're going to look at houses and schools. I'm sorry, what? I asked, confused on whether I'd even heard my mom correctly. All of a sudden, my eagerness to see the country, the Taj Mahal, the Bengal Tigers, vanished. And so, for the next four months, every single day, I pleaded with my parents to stay in Atlanta, my hometown, the only place I'd ever known. Secretly, I even hoped my dad's company would veto the expansion to India. When Jemathadi, the Hindu deity my family worships, did not respond to these prayers, I plotted to live with a friend for three years. And finally, in a last-ditch effort, much to the dismay of my parents, I unpacked the cardboard boxes that they had just taped up to ship to India. Nevertheless, four months later, I found myself in New Delhi, but not as a visitor. Stepping off the flight, New Delhi smelt different from Atlanta. The crowded airport emptied out into the bustling streets of the city, characterized by the pleas of beggars the honks of taxi drivers, and the moos of countless roaming cows. The noise continued even into my grandparents' apartment, where my aunts, uncles, and cousins, first and second, laughingly claimed that my sister and I were both NRIs, or not real Indians. I vividly remember my sister, who's named India, by the way, after the country we now lived in, whispered to me, what do they mean we're not real Indians? I'm named India, I have to be. <laughs> but we went on to hear that a lot, that we were not real Indians. Despite my appearance and the fact that I am actually Indian, <laughs> no one in the country seemed to think I was. Maybe it was my American accent or my poor Hindi, but that night, I definitely did not feel like I was. I longed for what felt like my real home, Atlanta my world had cracked into two. The next morning, my family went to tour my new school, the American Embassy School. Honestly, it was picturesque. Children were laughing and waterfalls were splashing, peacocks roamed the campus and marigolds sprung about. But the entire time, I couldn't help but think, this isn't my school in Atlanta. Continuing on with the orientation, my jet-lagged and indignant mind drifted in and out of the principal's speech, who advised us, if you're gonna live in India, you can't fight the crashing waves. You will drown. You sometimes just have to let them hit you to grow. But of course, as a 10-year-old, who had just moved 8,000 miles across an ocean, I fought each and every single wave that India presented. For the entire first year, I complained to my parents constantly, admittedly making their life hell. I hate the pollution, I hate the traffic, I hate not being able to watch sports, I hate my new school, I hate it all. And even mangoes weren't available all year round. <laughs> but eventually I realized I would not be returning to Atlanta anytime soon. 
So I decided for the first time to jump headfirst into the waves. First, I wanted to learn to read and write Hindi. Surprisingly, the Hindi alphabet has 46 different letters, including four that sound exactly like the English letter T to me, always throwing me for a curve. When speaking, my slight southern accent exaggerated my already stilted Hindi, another common laughing point for my relatives. Nevertheless, every morning on the bus ride to school and every evening on the way home, from the road signs, I would try and decipher the swirling and artistic script from the Delhi street names and neighborhoods. Eventually, I mastered my new talent, and I was obsessed. At every spare moment, I would be nagging my mother for words to try and spell, although I did have a couple of misspelled T's along the way. Second, I felt bored sometimes without sports in India. All the American football games aired at 2 or 3 a.m. Almost as if a solution to my problem, I came home one day to my dad sitting in front of the television, cheering. It was a cricket game. India was playing their rival, South Africa. In case you didn't know, in cricket, and this is an, in India, and this is an understatement, cricket is absolutely massive. Just driving down the street, the local parks teemed with makeshift cricket games with wickets made from stone. Also, in the 80s, when India surprised the entire world and won the Cricket World Cup, my dad, along with the entire nation, erupted in joy. So the TV was flicking through images of a batsman standing in the center of a circular field, awaiting the tosses of a speedy bowler. And much like the home run in baseball, fans would cheer ferociously when a batsman would hit the ball out of the park in the air or a six. So after explaining the rules of cricket to me, my dad hurriedly took me outside to a green strip of land as I held a leathery cricket ball in one hand and a way too heavy wooden bat for my 80 pound frame at the time in the other. My dad prepared to bowl to me as I stood there waiting with my bat and I swung and missed again and again and again. That was the day I ended up choosing to bowl rather than bat. <laughs> that night, Exhausted from the Delhi sun, back at our house, I asked my dad, why couldn't we have cricket in America? Finally, one day, my friend Rahul sprinted up to me, saying, we need to get the water balloons and colors for Holi. If you don't know, Holi is the Indian festival of colors to celebrate the upcoming harvest. All across the nation, people shoot water into the air and toss vibrant colors, and sometimes, more importantly, at their loved ones traditionally clad in all white. The popping colors represent the blooming flowers and fruits of the upcoming spring. This year, my band of skinny fifth graders, equipped with water balloons, prepared for war as the sprinklers dampened our battlefield. The pastel blue and crayon yellow colors mixed in with water stuck to our faces and bodies. Pandemonium ensued. Eventually, as the daylight faded, our legs tired and our stomachs growled. But that night, I remember asking my parents once again, why couldn't we have this in America? So how did I challenge the status quo? The world loves to categorize people. You're either white or you're black, or you're gay or you're straight, or you're a man or you're a woman. But identity is so much more than just a label. When people used to ask me, what am I? I desperately tried to fit myself into a box as an American or an Indian or even a mix of both. But the truth is, a label can't describe who you are or all the experiences and the thousands of years of history and culture that got you to where you are today. Thank you.